Okay, welcome to our workshop, uh, Food for Thought, the Key to Good Nutrition After Transplant. My name is Faith Williams, and I am the Loyalty Manager at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and I'm also a board member of Angel Flight East, and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. So we are looking forward to hearing a great presentation today. Uh, it will be my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Heather Ann Yonker. Ms. Yonker is a transplant dietitian in the Outpatient Adult Blood and Marrow Transplantation Program at the John Thur Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center. She provides nutrition assessment, counseling, and education to patients before, during, and after transplant. I just want to remind you we're going to take questions after Dr. Yonker's pre presentation, and this session is being audio recorded, so we're going to have you use the microphone for your questions. But right now, you can join me in welcoming Ms. Yonker. Okay. All righty. Let me know if you can't hear me because I guess I'm a little bit tall, and I was told this is a little short, so I'll do my best. Good morning. Um, I'm happy to be here and to be here with you all, survivors. <laughs> yes, um, and thank you for welcoming me. I must, I be, I'll begin by saying that I, it was just really, I'm, I have to apologize. I have many slides. And I, for some reason, I missed the section about time. So time is definitely not my forte, but I missed the section where it said 30 minutes. So I may have to skip over a few things. If, it, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them during the question and answer period or at lunch at any time. Um, I'm here for that reason. You can even call me afterwards in my office. So I, sorry if I have to go too, too fast. All right, so today's session, as was mentioned, these are my objectives. And we, you know, I'm going to be focusing on post-transplant and basic nutrition, and what to do to continue the survivorship and eating healthy, because it's all about how you eat, of course. Eating healthy, exercising, and weight management. It's as basic as that. Uh, I want to begin by saying I, lo I love this slide, not only because it's pretty, um, but because to eat is a necessity, but to eat intelligently is an art. Uh, that is so very profound. Not only if you have gone through cancer treatment or a stem cell transplant, but for the general public, for myself, eating is an art. It, in other words, it takes time and consideration uh, and effort sometimes and what to eat, how to balance the nutrients, how to eat properly. Um, it's not just only you may have an issue or you, the caregiver, may have an issue in figuring it out, but I do sometimes too, believe it or not. I'll begin by talking about this slide from the American Institute for Cancer Research Nutrition Guidelines. Many of you may be familiar with this. It, the acronym is AICR. Um, the AICR is very, very uh, many of my uh, fellow colleagues, dietitians, will use these guidelines. They're very basic. You can, you can actually, in your packet it included is the website. Go on their website and, and, and understand all these general guidelines or basic guidelines in detail. Um, so what the AICR does is they, they actually do research, research on the relationship of nutrition, physical activity, weight management, and its relationship to cancer risks. Um, and they interpret these scientific findings and educate the public about their choices. So we like to use it because it's research and it's pretty, and it's, it's basic and easy to understand. Uh, their basic premise is following a plant-based diet, consuming lean red meats as much as you can, and avoiding processed foods as much as you can. Every now and then, July 4th, whatever, Labor Day, we like a little sausage sandwich, a little hot dog, it's okay. But as a normal part of the diet is strong research and strong links to um, uh, other cancers and other diseases. Uh, being physically active and aiming to be as healthy throughout life as much as you, as you can, as much as control as you can. Uh, this slide, I'm sorry, it's a little dramatic and a little off, actually, but anyway. Um, the idea of this slide is that does poor nutrition actually uh, cause bone marrow complications? And we really, you know, that's a really very difficult question. 
but I think it's the other way around. We know that uh, bone marrow complications can lead to poor nutrition, uh, especially if one, and you know, I know you're, you, we have a variety of uh, patients in the room or caregivers, you, you may be actually actively on the treatment or maybe post-transplant immediately or many years post-transplant. So your responses to this might be a little bit different. But we, we know that once you're on the treatment and you're experiencing all the typical side effects, eventually it can lead to uh, chronic fatigue, uh, anemia, uh, poor intake. Poor, all of this will lead to poor nutrition. So there is a relationship there. The idea is how to fix it and how to prevent it. Mm, what is that? Anyway. All right. This slide depicts exactly what the AICR is trying to translate. You remember the food guy pyramid? Actually, prior to that, when we were kids, some of us, yeah? Remember the basic four food groups? Please say yes. Because <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm... <laughs> All right, there any like 21 year olds in here? Maybe not. But the four, the basic four, group, four food groups were, you know, we all studied that in home economics class. Um, and then moved on to dietary guidelines, the food guide pyramid, and now we're on to the my plate uh, concept. So the my plate, it was very, very confusing to many people in the late. Actually, to help professionals to try to translate it sometimes was confusing. So it's as basic as this making sure that half of your plate. Is, consists of carbohydrates, whole grain breads and cereals, and whole fruits and vegetables each and every day. Most of your diet should consist of this. Then we move on to the bottom of the plate where it's a smaller section that low-fat uh, dairy products like cheese and milk and yogurt and kefir, um, and lean, lean servings of red meat, poultry, turkey, um, and alternative products like dried beans and peas, because you don't have to eat meat to get protein, as you know, right? You can, it can be derived from dried beans and peas and tofu and tempeh and so on. Um, and a very small, the narrowest section of that plate is what? High-fat foods, greasy foods, hamburgers and french fries and hot dogs and you know, the good stuff. Um, but that should be an occasional treat, because there's really no bad food. We don't like that concept. There's no bad food. Everything is needed, but some are needed very, very infrequently. For instance, the high-fat foods. Switching gears a little bit. So taking the my, the, the, the my plate concept, and how does this translate to bone marrow transplant and survivorship? Just a quick overview of some of the, uh, of course, stem cells and the bone marrow components of these are vast, much more than just red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. For purposes of this class, we narrowed it down to this. Um, as you know, red blood cells uh, carries oxygen to the cells, and when the red blood cells are low, as you find a lot in blood cancers, what happens? Not enough oxygen to the, to the cells. Very often leading to anemia, leading to fatigue, chronic fatigue. Um, platelets, Platelets promote a stability in the cells, as we consider it homeostasis, it's called. Uh, once, once the cells are damaged or the vessels are damaged, it may not cause the blood to clot, causing excessive bleeding. So it's very, very important, and many of you may know this very well, you may need to be transfused every now and then with uh, blood transfusion or platelet transfusion to get it back to a normal level. Uh, white blood cells, there's many components to the white blood cells. But, you know, the white blood cells is one of the most important aspects of the immune system. And, uh, and especially, you know, for purposes of this class, white blood cells work to destroy uh, bacteria and destroy viruses. Once the white blood cells are low, what happens? You're at a higher risk for infections, um, foodborne illnesses. So this is why your, physicians, your physician, your nurse practitioner, your dietitian will will really stress constantly that you need to wear your mask out in public, um, you need to wash hands properly, avoid uh, contaminated foods, and so on. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But the white blood cells play an, ex an integral part of the whole uh, uh, control in the immune system. For my purpose, uh, you know, the, the lecture on the blood, I don't know if there's another lecture on that, but that's very, very detailed. For my purpose, is nu nutrients and its effect on the immune system and its effect on white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. What nutrients affect these? 
This is a short list of them. It's a much longer, much more detailed list. But I thought these were kind of important. I can't talk about all of them in 30 minutes, so <laughs> we'll try to touch base on, on these few. Uh, protein. Protein, an integral part of the immune system. Uh, it's a building block of every cell, and it, it also is important for tissue repair. What happens when you receive chemotherapy and radiation and immunosuppressive medications? Tissues are affected. Organs are affected. So when we say tissue, we mean just what organs itself, everything for repair. Uh, if you are eating insufficient amounts of protein or insuff insufficient amounts of food, what happens? The body naturally turns to, if you're not getting enough carbohydrates, which gives you energy, enough fat, which gives you energy, protein gives you energy. Just those three nutrients. If you're not eating sufficient amounts of food, the body naturally turns to protein for energy. That's just a natural physiological response. Once it turns, once it starts using protein as energy, it breaks it down. So you become, your muscles start breaking down. You become very weak. And many of you know what I'm speaking about. Right after therapy, you know, a matter of a week or two, it's difficult to walk up a couple steps. Um, so the idea is to, don't matter if you're just right after transplant or if you're two years or five years after, trans, after tra stem cell transplant, it's important to maintain that muscle mass simply by these foods. Lean meats and poultry and seafood, milk, yogurt, kefir, uh, cheeses, lean cheeses, or low-fat cheeses, nuts, walnuts, sunflower seeds, uh, almonds, and cashews. And I put whey protein on the bottom because uh, it's not the first choice I would want to think of. The first choice is actually eating whole foods. But if, you, if, if for some reason you, you think you need an extra amount of protein, you may want to consider adding a protein powder to your food. Uh, to something more, it's like a shake or um, applesauce or something like that, soups. Uh, whey protein in particular is gentle on the tummy, it's easy to digest, and it's a good way to get extra amounts of protein. But if you're going about your business, you've recovered and you're eating healthy and you're just trying to get wholesome food, there's no need to supplement more with a protein powder. Uh, Essential fatty acids. Essential fatty acids play an integral part also on the immune system. And, you know, it's, anti, it's considered to be an anti-inflammatory. It is omega-3s and omega-6s, okay? And typically in our American diet, we receive much more omega-6s than we should. Uh, from baked goods and, you know, candies and, and, and uh, chips and so on corn oil and vegetable oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil. These are the foods that are considered to, be, to have omega-6s. They're important, but in small percentages. What we really want to promote and what you really want to do is have a higher, a higher amount of omega-3s. It's anti-inflammatory, it's heart protecting, okay? Omega-3s are what? Fatty fish, salmon, tuna, sardines. Sardines packed in olive oil is a great source of a lot of things, but omega-3s they are. Um, no, sardines are wonderful, just wonderful. Sorted with some onion and tomatoes, you, ha you make a day. Um, and some alternative, uh, alternative sources also, like nuts, walnuts, and pine nuts, flax seeds, chia seeds. I, uh, chia seeds actually is new to me. I don't know if you're very familiar with it but I heard it from a famous uh, physician show on TV that, about chia seeds, and it opened up our eyes. The, uh, at the John Thorough Cancer Center, we were lucky to have a, a cooking studio, a beautiful cooking studio, state-of-the-art, sort of like uh, food TV, and we did, um, we did a whole chia seed, uh, uh, sh not show, but cooking demonstration. Yes, thank you. Cooking demonstration. And uh, it was a brand new thing to me. It's, it's high in protein. Chia seeds are very, very tiny. They, you add it to foods. You add it to moist foods. So it's something I haven't really experimented with, but I thought it's important to answer because it's all over the place. And it's added to a lot of things. Anyway, some other alternatives is avocado. Avocado is a rich source of omega-3s as well. Um, not to mention magnesium and selenium, okay, and monounsaturated fats. So it's, a very, it's high in calorie, by the way, but it's a good source to have just about every other day. So I mentioned these whole foods. For many of these foods you may not be eating, like fish. A lot of people don't like fish. I don't understand why, but a lot of people don't like fish. So if you have to depend on, on an omega supplement, that's fine unless your platelets are low. 
So omega-3s, the recommendation is from a fish oil supplement, omega-3 supplement, it means the same thing, the ratio should be one to one. So 1,000 milligrams of DHA and 1,000 milligrams of EPA. Those are, when you buy a fish oil supplement, it's clearly listed on the label that way. Um, if your platelets are running low, and you've been told so by your physician, uh, your doctor's office, you certainly do not want to supplement any extras. I just want to reinforce that, all right, because it can make the platelets even lower, okay? Vitamin C and vitamin A, vitamin E, which I'll talk about in a second, these are all antioxidants. Antioxidants uh, are, are crucial in protecting the cells. That's the basic job of an antioxidant, um, protecting the DNA, for immune function, for wound healing. Um, vitamin C is actually extremely important. I, if anyone is under therapy, however, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, it really, really is important that you do not supplement with large amounts, omega dosing amounts of these antioxidants because they can interact with the chemotherapy. Um, so the recommend, so foods that are high in vitamin A and vitamin C kind of stick into that my plate again, large amounts of fruits and vegetables, dark green leafy vegetables like kale and spinach and collard greens. These are rich sources, low in calorie and rich sources of, of antioxidants. Orangey vegetables like uh, squashes and spinach, we're heading into that seat, and sweet potatoes, a rich way to get beta carotene or vitamin A. Um, and extremely important, carrots, extremely important in the diet. And mangoes and cantaloupe and all this. Raspberry berries and on, on, on its whole, raspberries, blueberries, goji berries, uh, that's another new thing in my list, like the chia seeds, is one of the richest sources of antioxidants. Um, berries are really, really dense in antioxidants. So if you are, and I'll talk about juicing later on, if you're into juicing, you really want to not use only berries because they're so rich in antioxidants. You want to mix it up a little bit with other colors of the fruits and vegetables. You know, I, just to talk a little bit again about this vitamin C, there's a lot of studies uh, coming down the pipeline on vitamin C. In a Maybe in a couple of years, I may change my whole uh, talk on promoting vitamin C and, and how much. There's a lot of link and a lot of talk about vitamin C and cancer prevention. Um, a lot of it is not fully studied yet, fully understood, um, and not published. So once it is, that's what we may change it up a bit. But for now, we're saying to keep it simple and keep it at whole foods and fruits and vegetables. B vitamins is also another vital, a vital part of the immune system, vital in protecting the immune system. Um, you need B vitamins for red blood cell formation. So typically, at least in our center, after stem cell transplant, many, many of our patients will be, our allogeneic patients especially, will be prescribed a, a, a therapeutic level or a prescription level of vitamin B12 and folic acid. Um, each center does things differently. So just want to make that clear. If you have, if you have not, it's because your physician does it, uh, have a different protocol. Um, because we realize it's, it's very important in helping those red cells to be formed. How can you achieve this if you're not doing so? By wholesome foods again. Lean red meat is one of your richest sources of the B vitamins. And by the way, B vitamins is a complex. It's, it, it, it's a host of other B vitamins. So it's niacin, it's B12, it's folic acid, it's thiamine. Um, biotin, riboflavin. Um, but the most important ones to pay attention to is folic acid and vitamin B12 in, re in reference to red blood cell you know, production. So lean red meats, dark, dark poultry meat, uh, egg yolks, dark green leafy vegetables, legumes, or dry beans and peas are really very rich. Many whole grain products are fortified with B vitamins because once you have process something, especially like white, let's say white flour, you remove that, that outer coating of, of, of the grain and you remove the vitamins. You remove a lot of the vitamins. So companies, you know, years ago decided it has to be re-added, you know, added back to this, so fortified with these vitamins. And that's why we say stick to whole grain breads and cereals. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is really interesting to many of us. Vitamin D is just, it's vital to the immune system. It's linked, it's being linked to numerous diseases. Many of us actually in society these days, myself included, level is a little bit low 
Uh, I grew up in the Caribbean in the heat of the sun, so I'm not really sure what's going on, but our levels tend to be low. We know with you, uh, especially some of these immunosuppressive medications, the levels we see in critical low levels, in the single digits. Very often you may be recommended to have a therapeutic dosage, which is 50,000 international units a, a week, per week, and that's okay. That's safe, it's per week. We retest your levels probably every three months or so, and once the levels get back to normal level, you know, you bring the dosages down. So that's very, very common that we're seeing. But for, the, for those of you in the room who have not, who levels have been normal, the recommendation is 600 international units. That was changed two summers ago. And the upper limits of 4,000. I mention that because I see all the time patients will tell me they're taking large dosages. The studies are not strong, and this is what we have to go by, evidence-based. The studies are not strong on more than 4,000 units and how effective it is and if it can cause other problems. So I really recommend that you consider that if you're deciding to take vitamin D. Um, I know there's a lot of stuff on the Internet about it. Foods that are high in vitamin D, I have to talk about whole foods. Fatty fish again. Salmon. The be well, the best source of, of, of uh, vitamin D is what? The sun. The sunshine, yes. Uh, 30 minutes. All it takes is 30 minutes in the sun. But what? Most of you can't be in the sun. Or you can't be in the sun for long periods without sun protection. So you have to depend on supplementation of food. So fatty fish like salmon and sardines and tuna and mackerel, these are rich, rich sources. Sardines, is in, I, I have to really promote this. Not only does it remind me of childhood and my dad making sandwiches, but it is really very extremely healthy for you. Uh, fortified foods are fortified with them. Um, with, uh, I just noticed my thing is off. <laughs> foods are fortified with vitamin D, also like dairy products and cheeses and so on. Dark green leafy vegetables, also egg yolks are rich. Egg yolks are rich, rich in vitamin D as well. Okay. I mentioned about vitamin E being an antioxidant with the vitamin C and vitamin A a second ago. Uh, it's also promote healthy skin and healthy eyes. Uh, foods that are rich in vitamin E are nuts and seeds and egg yolks, wheat germ. Wheat germ is a great source of vitamin E. But I want to mention one thing. The studies, again, came out a couple years ago that weren't strong in its connection to protecting the heart. Many people were supplementing like crazy with vitamin E. I also want to mention if you are taking a daily aspirin and if you are on any anti-clotting agent, you know, like Coumadin as an example, um, you certainly don't, do not want to take any extra amounts of vitamin E. What's in food is different. It's metabolized differently. But any supplementation of vitamin E. Okay. Iron also, another nutrient that's integral part. Many patients you meet all the time will say that I have a blood disease, I have blood cancer, and I need to take iron supplements. Absolutely do not. We are very strict about this at our center. Do not supplement with iron unless it is prescribed. In order for it to be prescribed, you have to be defined with or diagnosed with an iron deficiency anemia. That's an extra test. So we do those all the time to figure out what's going on. And if we said, you know, if we, if we did not prescribe it, do not take it. Because what can happen is you can eventually, it takes a little while, but eventually it could lead to iron overload. And iron overload, iron deposits in different organs in the body causing serious damage. Um, so we don't recommend it. But from wholesome foods, okay? And I, you know, I think this is interesting enough. 800, 18 milligrams for women, 8 milligrams for men, 8 milligrams for postmenopausal women. Once you're, once you're postmenopausal, you don't need as much iron in the body. Um, so lean red meats, dried fruits, uh, uh, like figs and apricots and so on, and lots of whole grain breads are fortified with iron as well. Important to remember on the bottom, on the bottom of this slide, it says take a vitamin C food with an iron sup with an iron rich meal. That's because vitamin C helps iron to be absorbed extremely effectively in the body. So if you're having a nice steak and a spinach salad, you want to have a glass of uh, tomato juice or orange juice or something. Just one example. Zinc, another, you know, to end this off, another nutrient that's vital to the immune system and to immune function, uh, immune integrity, um, taste changes. You know, some studies have, did come out a, a few years back in patients with zinc deficiency, 
takes a longer time for the taste buds to come back. Uh, and, you know, the taste becomes very severe. The taste changes become very severe. So how do you get zinc? Zinc is absolutely necessary in the body. You need lean meats, shellfish. Shellfish is one of the richest sources, actually, of, uh, of zinc. Liver. I know, I usually don't put that on my slide, but I put it on because, you know, liver is good. I like liver. But it's also high in cholesterol, so we don't really want to promote it as much. But some people do like it every now and then. Uh, sunflower seeds, rich sources of, of zinc, walnuts, fortified breads, and cereals again. So this is just a quick synopsis of the AICR. It takes into consideration all those nutrients I mentioned and the MyPlate concept. I just want to talk about quickly about number six. Number six is about alcohol drinking. We know that life gets back to normal. If some of you are way post-transplant and may enjoy a drink every, every now and then, or maybe a little more than every now and then, um, alcohol interacts with medication. So some of you are still on a low-dose steroid. It will interact with medication. Be wise how you do it. Speak to your, your physician about it, your nurse, your nurse practitioner, and, you know, we'll can give you a little more information and, and, and the appropriateness of it. All right, switching gears really quickly. Um, I have no idea how much time I have, but we'll keep on going. Uh, <laughs> fad, di <laughs> fad diets. The reason I put this slide in is because meeting patients long-term or post-transplant, uh, many of you may have gained weight because like, I like the alcohol drinking, you go back to normal life, eating healthy again, you feel good. Uh, and not to mention, these medications don't do so well when it comes to the weight. A lot of these medications interact, you know, this, uh, and, and cause you to gain weight. Every time I met a patient in the last few months, they tell me what special diet they were, they were on. I was, would write it down, and I figured that would be good on the slide. So these are some of the typical diets I hear that patients are doing. Um, we, I do not promote most of them. I know some of them are very common, and I listed some of the diets that patients tell me about the paleo diet, gluten-free. I get a lot of questions about gluten-free and juicing. Um, some people are finding great benefits in them. I say if, 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 if you have read about it and you understand it really well, you speak to a healthcare professional and you understand how to balance them, then it may make sense. And if it helps your symptoms of whatever they may be, uh, it, may, it may be appropriate. But if you're just doing it for pure weight loss, that's not a that's not, not appropriate reason to do it because many of them are not well balanced. For instance, gluten free. You can be missing out on tons of B vitamins. Okay, gluten free diet because you're missing out on gluten, which is found in whole grain breads and cereals. I want to just touch really focus on juicing though. Juicing is very um, common, very popular. Everyone's juicing. People are juicing to lose weight, to cleanse their body, to prevent cancer from coming back. None of it has been proven. Okay, some of it bogus, especially when it comes to the cleansing of the body. Um, I think where it's appropriate is if you are not a good vegetable and fruit eater. Shame on you. No. If you're not a good vegetable and fruit eater, you, this is a great way to condense your fruits and vegetables. So juicing, mixing up the colors of the juice, of the fruits and vegetables, not focusing on just one nutrient. For instance, an example would be carrot juicing. You may be getting way too concentrated source of vitamin A or beta carotene which interacts with a lot of medication and chemotherapy or radiation. So we really want you to mix it up. Um, juicing could add a lot more calories than you think. So if you're only on a liquid diet, you may be getting way more calories than you know because it's concentrated forms of sugar. It can be low fiber as well because you're removing the pulp and the skin which provides fiber. So unless you have one of those fancy machines as we have in our cooking studio, the Vitamix, anybody? It's like 800 bucks. The Vitamix really actually blends everything and keeps the fiber in there. But if not, like the rest of us, you may just have to use you know, your regular blender at home and try to keep the, the actual skin of it on rather than losing that. Okay. I don't like diets. Whoa. I don't like diets. <laughs> um, I said, well, because I have to speed it up a little bit. I don't like the term diets, per se, but for argument's sake, if you must follow a diet, these are the ones that we strongly recommend, okay? The Mediterranean, the DASH, the Weight Watchers, because they are, they are balanced nutritionally, they are flexible, they're easy to understand, 
okay, easy to adhere to, um, uh, and just, just easy to follow. Not to mention Mediterranean diet promotes, you know, using olive oil because it's heart protective. You can get a ton of this information on the, on the internet if you need to know it more. Really quickly, I want to talk, switch gears real fast and talk about um, oral supplementation again. If you decide that you want to do it, and I know it's, it comes up a lot in my, in my work, that patients will do, you know, large amounts of vitamins. And sometimes I understand why. I understand why, the concept. But you really have to understand what you're doing. So ask yourself these questions. Is my diet restricted of any nutrients? Like, why am I doing this? And speak to one of the professionals that, that you trust. Just to reinforce it again, these are some of the nutrients that you do not want to mega dose or take large amounts on. I, I had a patient recently that was uh, actually doing 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. 10,000. The recommendation is 75. So, and I know it's, the recommendations are based on, um, are based on healthy individuals. So, and it's water soluble, so the body can handle a little bit more. But 10,000 just seems really incredible. And, and, and we know that a lot of studies are coming down the pipeline. They are. And, and like I said earlier, I may change this whole plan. I'm not sure we'll ever say 10,000 is enough. That is seriously megadosing. Overprotecting the cells and causing more havoc than needs to be. All right? Herbs are supplements too. This is actually a really important slide and important information to remember. Uh, herbs interact with many medications, um, especially chemotherapy medications. St. John's wort can go a very dangerous, actually. And if you're on any chemotherapy, you should not be taking them. If you're on any anti-clotting medications, you should not be taking them. Um, grapefruit, grapefruit is interesting. Grapefruit interact. It's, believe it or not, it's considered an herb in this sense. Um, but it interacts with many medications. So we don't even, I think nationwide, it's not offered in any menu in hospitals for that reason. So no grapefruit or no grapefruit juice, especially if you're on immunocompromised, immunosuppressive medications like cyclosporin and prednisone and so on. A lot of, a lot of herbs, I hear, um, uh, moving fast, but some of these medications, some of these herbal, you know, we work with an array of patients from all around the country, all around the world, which is fascinating in itself. But a lot of patients will bring in things from out of the country to take, and a lot of them are immune boosting. So if we are doing chemotherapy or radiation therapy to suppress your immune system, and this is boosting the immune system, it's really very, con it's contradicting and can cause serious havoc. This is a list of some typical websites that's listed on your, in your sheets that you may want to take for the look if you decide to do vitamin supplementation. I want to just talk really fast, am I talking too fast? About probiotics. And the reason why I thought it was important to put this on here is because I get lots of questions. Everyone's probioting me. <laughs> I created a new word here. Everyone's taking probiotics. So, Someone I met last week, she told me she's taking three times a day because that's what she heard on the commercial. I don't know what commercial, but she's doing in the billions. We don't really know for sure. So if you're immunocompromised right now, it really is not a smart idea to take a probiotic pill because you're, you, the GI tract becomes very, very, very sensitive, um, very susceptible to anything. This is a live bacteria that you're swallowing and could cause havoc in the blood. So if you're not immunocompromised and you're so far beyond all these medications, then it may be fine, especially if you're on an antibiotic. But the best idea is to really get it through a, 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 a dairy product, a pasteurized product like yogurt. The Greek yogurts are a great way to get it. Kefir um, and some other cottage cheese and some other cheeses. Okay, uh, I was seriously looking the other day to find a yogurt that was inexpensive. I spent a good 10 minutes in the grocery store. It was inexpensive, high protein, high calcium, probiotics. And I found one that was a store brand. Store brand one that was just as tasty and just as good. But you have to know what you're looking for. Skip over this. Food safety guidelines. It is not just post-transplant. It is for all of us because... If you follow the news and read the newspaper regularly, you know this happens. There's food recall all the time. I get a list every Monday morning from the USDA. 
from the FDA, sorry, it is just amazing how many foods are recalled. So you want to pay attention to it. Uh, it's really indicated for those of you who are uh, immunocompromised, autologous transplants, uh, allogeneic transplants, and maybe under chemotherapy. If you're not, there's no need to be so, so strict, but you need to be careful. So most importantly, I want to pinpoint the point about washing hands at least for 20 seconds. That's the important thing to remember. I like to tell the kids in the daycare, wash your hands for 20 seconds, sing a song. That's very, very important to remember. And the others are common sense, you know. Cooking food properly, avoiding buffets, open buffets, buying cut up fruits in the grocery store because they're not following the same procedure as you would at home. Okay? I provided you a lovely, just to finish this off, a lovely college sheet on the dirty dozen because another quick uh, question I get is from, is about should I follow organic? Organic is very complex. It's an individual decision. We know there's a lot of link, there's a lot of foods with pesticides added. And a lot of it is out of our control. It takes, like that first slide I had, it takes consideration, eating, eating, eating intelligently is an art. It really is. You really need to decide and prioritize what's important and what's healthy. So if you pick one or two things off that list, that college sheet I gave you, I think it, will, it, it makes sense. To do everything could be very expensive. So that's an individual choice, and it's an individual choice that I choose myself. Um, but it, the studies are still not very strong, so we're, we're trying, and we're trying to understand it. All right. This is a, a, a list of the nutrition resources. I like eatright.org. It's, it's uh, the American Dietetic Association to promote them. But all these websites are very good to give you further information about nutrition and expand on it a little bit more, basic questions being answered. And that's my quick review. I like this slide the most because that's a beautiful beach where I come from in Trinidad and Tobago, and it, it, it keeps me happy to look at it all the time, this picture. At the same time, the idea is that you remain as positive as you can. And I say all that because the my plate and the fruits and vegetables, it's all good and great. But if you're not mentally, emotionally stable and in a good place with good support and good therapy or whatever it may take, if you're not stable, those things may not matter. Once this is, once, you know, the mind is okay, then all those things fall into place. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jonker, for that great presentation. So now's the time we're going to open the floor to questions. Uh, remember, this is being recorded, so you're going to need the microphone. Uh, I will start over here with the lady in the black and then the gentleman in the blue. Hi. Thank Hello. you. It was informational. Two things. How soon after transplant can you resume, if ever, having honey? and miso and all the other list of foods. And secondly, just as a general, I had a horrible experience um, mm -hmm. taking an herbal, I'm not a cancer survivor, but mm -hmm. I had a horrible experience taking an herbal supplement that I did not know had a sedative in it, mm -hmm. got into a single car crash, ended up in the hospital uninjured. They held me for observation, found out it was the herb in DMV, for three years, I had to send in a statement every six months oh from my, my doctor. Goodness. They were going to take away my license. So I caution everyone yeah. to be very careful with herbal supplements. Yeah. And, it, I, you know, um, thank you for sharing that. But it is, you know, herbals do have its place. I don't want to totally say it's, it does not. And it's a huge growing market. There's a lot of promotion. The reason I talked about that, uh, many of our patients go to herbalists. They go to alternative physicians. I don't know if anybody's in the room is one, but you know, they, I understand, we understand the, the difficulty we have in, in, in saying that you need to really do your research because they affect uh, the way medications are metabolized in the body, interaction is pretty strong. It can sometimes drop your blood pressure incredibly. Um, and I'm not quite sure if that's what, what happened, if that's what you said. Uh, oh, sedative, right? There's a lot of issues with it. And, and in a sense, for stem cell transplant, a lot of them could, could have fungus and bacteria, which, you know, the liver is just waiting for a fungus, waiting for trouble. So you really need to do, to do the research and make sure that it is safe and studied, because some of it may be okay. 
but we have, so we need to do research. Your second part of your, your first part of your question was about when you can have honey and um, what's the other question? What's that part? Miso. Right. So it really depends. If you've received an autologous transplant, this is strictly textbook, we say three months after transplant to resume. For allogeneic patients, until you are off your immunosuppressive medications. So that could be three months, you know, 100 days. It could be six months. You could be on and off again. It really does depend. That's why you need to have a conversation with us regularly. Um, honey, the reason for honey is because of the risk of botulism. That is very real. Raw honey, not the packaged honeybee store brand honey that's been processed and processed. We're talking about the, the good, healthy, high antioxidant honey, um, the raw stuff you buy at the farm. So those you need to lay off a little bit. That's, that's a re that could be a real issue. Miso is fermented, um, and that it's not really cooked. It's the fermentation process. The same thing with raw tofu, not like anybody eats that, but it needs to be cooked. Um, uh, so until you're weaned off the immunosuppressive medications, steroid, cyclosporin, Celsept, I know there's more. Tacrolimus, yes. Serolimus. Um. What was it? Dirty dozen list. Uh, I noticed that you listed the uh, plus. When you say plus, does that mean that's better than the dirty dozen list? The hot peppers. The plus. Better. What, what screen are you on? This. Uh, Is that yours? No, that's not mine. I wish. Oh, I'm sorry. Where did I get that from? <laughs> it is or isn't? It's mine and not mine. This is actually from the Environmental Working Group. Okay, I'm sorry. So that would be very cool if my colleagues and I had developed okay. this. But now, this is basically, uh, where is the plus? Hot peppers. Re oh, okay. You know what? It's, it's just, this is just an advertising thing. It's plus hot peppers and kale because they added it on. I bet you this is 14 and 15. Is it? Yeah. Okay, that's why. That's all that means. It just added on these extra foods on the list. Okay, so hot peppers are right, good. The dirty 14 list. <laughs> <laughs> well, nevertheless, any kind of hot peppers? Yes. Yeah. I, yes. I, my mother used to eat the hot peppers right out of the jar. My dad, too. I know. Them, but okay. They're good yeah. for you, then. Uh, well, they are good for you. Capsaicin has a lot of protective. But in reference to stem cell transplant, we want you to cook it. We want you to wash the hot peppers and cook them. Yeah. Not the ones you buy in the jar, um, you know, heat it up a little bit. Because probably, it, actually I take that back. That probably is a little softer. That probably has been already heat treated. Okay. The ones in the bottle. The ones in the bottle? Yes, the roasted ones. Oh, the heat, they're, they're heat treated, so more than likely it's safe for you. It's fine. The hotter the better? Um, <laughs> well, I am from the Caribbean, yes. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I don't know that I eat a raw vegetable diet, but I eat a lot of vegetables raw, and mm -hmm. I eat a lot of fruit raw. Mm -hmm. I like it, and mm -hmm. so I eat a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But you have it on there as a warning kind of against yeah. that. Well, I had it as a warning in reference to dieting. Yeah. The raw food diet is actually a diet. Oh, okay. So you may be, you eat meat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're not on the raw food diet. People no. want a raw food diet are strictly on raw. No. I eat all kinds of stuff, but I eat probably six or seven servings a day. Then you're raw following fruit, the My Plate vegetables. concept. Yeah. <laughs> that is wonderful because if you can get six to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, I give you kudos to you. That is, it's not as easy. It's nice to talk about. <laughs> but it's not as easy. It, it, it takes work. Yes. Good for you. Two questions. Mm -hmm. What is the store brand yogurt you found to be very good? <laughs> and also, I don't serve raw berries anymore mm -hmm. because you can't wash or peel them. Mm -hmm. Is our frozen berries, blueberries, raspberries, is that a good alternative? Does that mm. um, inactivate any fungus or bacteria mm -hmm. that might be on a berry? Okay, so the first part of your question in reference to yogurt, it was ShopRite, my favorite place, it seems like. So it was just a ShopRite brand vanilla yogurt. And you know, it, you go to the yogurt section, there's so much to choose from. I mean, even Chobani has like five different, it's, it's too confusing. So just keep it simple. 
the store brand, the shop brand. Secondly, in reference to berries, if you are not immunocompromised, if you're told that your immune system is not low, then it's not a concern. But if you are, berries are hard to wash, yes. Frozen berries, no. They are not being washed before, before actually freezing. So we actually had to make these simple phone calls. We had an intern call uh, the Dole Company. First we thought, well, this is silly, but it was really important. They are not. However, they're starting to. This is what the management mentioned to us, that they're going to start doing this because there have been so many issues with foodborne illnesses. So frozen berries are not washed before they're frozen. So, but, however, if you're making pancakes or you're making a muffin or something, it doesn't really matter because you're going to be heating it. You're going to be heating it up, cooking it. But if you're just juicing or putting it just like that, then that could be a concern, yes. If you're immunocompromised. Or in a pie or oatmeal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In a pie or oatmeal or something like that. Then it's fine. It's not even a second thought. It's a good way to get your antioxidants and so on. And that includes, that includes uh, fresh, if you want to wash them really well. Mm -hmm. Hi. I apologize. Oh. I might have missed something because I slipped in a little late. But could you explain um, in more detail the problems with the gluten-free free diet uh, in relate, relating to weight gain? And also, is it, is it um, just when you replace items with gluten with items meant to replace them or if you just say I'm not eating bread I'm going to eat more fruit or something instead is to still have a combination effects. of both really yeah. so the issues with you know the only diagnosis that gluten free diet is really uh, strongly recommended for and suggested by the American Medical Association the American Dietetic Association and so on is celiac disease so celiac disease is actually a disease where patients are not able to um, break down that protein, that gluten that's found in food. And if you can't do this, you would know right away. The, the, it's like an, a severe allergic reaction you will, you will experience. So not to mention many, many, many symptoms. There's a special test for that. Some patients are saying that, or some people in society are saying now that they are gluten sensitive. So when they eat bread, they feel funny. And they feel better if they don't eat it. Um, that's still very controversial. It's really hard to figure out sometimes. If you don't, if you if you're avoiding gluten foods, which are whole breads and whole grain breads and cereals and so on, you are avoiding B vitamins. B vitamins help with red blood cell formation. It helps with a number of different reasons. Um, so you're missing out. The most it, it's come a long way. I have to tell you, in 20 years, it has come a long way. I went to a nutrition lect, uh, conference like this in New Orleans not too long ago, and it was amazing. There were rows and rows of companies with gluten-free products. So they're starting to pay attention. They are paying attention because it's, it's a huge market. Um, and they're fortifying a lot of these foods with B vitamins. Not everything is fortified, so you need to read the label and say, it may say it on there. But many of the breads and grains and cereals are fortified with uh, with B vitamins. That's the important nutrient really to remember, the B vitamins. Um, uh, if you're just, if you're not eating the alternatives, if you decide you want to do a gluten-free diet and you're eating just fruits and vegetables, then you're not getting all the vitamins and minerals that you need and the protein that you need. So you need, you need to have foods from each and every food group, not in large amounts, but at least every single day and every single meal to have something from each food group. attended your um, workshop at John Thayer, okay. and you had mentioned about cutting cantaloupes, watermelons oh. <laughs> with two different knives. And what, oh, did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> and I think of you every morning. Oh, no. <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> well, the reason why we say that is because of the bacteria that is loaded on the melon. Now, regularly, it's not an issue, you know, we may wash it. I wash it now too, by the way. I never used to. But what we, it's because the melons, especially cantaloupe. Do you remember a few years back, there was a big E. coli outbreak with cantaloupe? Um, and our fruits are coming from far. Now we're heading into the winter season. They're coming, they're sitting in warehouses, and they go into the grocery store, and then they're going into your, into your basket. It's, it's, it's taking a long time to get to our table. So we recommend that you wash it really well. Uh, one knife... You don't have to have two knives, really. 
Why not if you cut into the fruit? If you don't wash that fruit, that's where the cross-contamination occurs, from the skin to the actual fruit itself. So we say cut the fruit, rinse your knife, peel it, rinse your knife, and then eat it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You don't need to have, you know, you need two different cutting boards and two different knives. If, you, if for some Hello. reason you have meat products close by, let's face it, sometimes we're preparing fast, so we're having guests over, and there's meat going and vegetables going and fruit going, you know, that's when you need to really pay attention and think about what you're doing. Um, uh, using the vegetable sprays or a paper towel to wipe it off, it's fine too. And that's why you should not buy it already cut up in the grocery store. Because believe you me, in my favorite store, they are not washing the, the melons and then cutting it up and rinsing the knife. Uh-uh. They're going fast. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if you're immunocompromised, can you eat raisins, nuts, or granola? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's a great way to get, you know, all the essential nutrients. Fiber. I didn't talk a lot about fiber, but fiber, selenium, magnesium from dried fruits, raisins, figs, apricots, dried pineapples. What we don't recommend you do if you're immunocompromised is going to the stores at a whole food store and scooping it out because it's really dusty. Not to mention hands, you know, kids are touching things. We're into flu season really soon or if we're not there already. People are coughing and touching. I saw it the other day, oh my. Coughing and then touching the food and putting it back. So I didn't think I'd really see it, but I did see it. <laughs> Okay, we've got time for one more Buying question. a package is what we recommend. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Um, there's a lot of talk in some circles and maybe in the news about um, like sh sh the role of sugar in mm -hmm. causing can some cancers. Yeah. And I just am curious what your thoughts are on that. I actually took the slide, not like I needed another slide, but I took the slide out and sugar, really. <laughs> um, that is one of those very, very controversial uh, sub, uh, thoughts. We actually put on a program that was just on sugar at the hospital once. Um, it's a whole lecture. There are circles talking about it. There are physicians promoting it. Um, you know, the sugar cause cancer. Any, the whole concept with that is anything in excess may put you at a higher risk for cancer and other diseases, and sugar is one of them. Sugar is considered a carbohydrate. So there are different forms of sugar. There's table sugar, there's whole grain, there's carbohydrates, those are sugars. Those are natural sugars. Fruits and vegetables are natural sugars. So we need sugar in our diet, we need carbohydrates in our diet. A lot of those fat diets, that slide I showed you, may be low sugar, hence causing, if you decide you're not gonna do sugar, or carbohydrates, it leads to fatigue, it leads to mood swings, massive headaches until you regulate yourself again. So, bad cells in the body, good cells love sugar. You need sugar for cells to function. But the bad cells do love it, I have to admit. The cancer cells love it. So what we say is to be moderate with it. The my plate concept. Hold some fruits and vegetables, whole grains, breads, bread and, breads and cereals, meats, and if every now and then you need to have a little treat because we need a little treat. So I will not tell you not to have a chocolate chip cookie, one, or a little, a small size slice of a cake, small is the operative word. So in moderation, small, small amounts of, of, of sugar where you can control because there will be times in your day that you can't control it. And when you can buy foods like granola and so on that has a low amount of sugar added to it, then you do so. A good tip to remember really quickly, if you're buying any product, the label should say five grams or less, that's a pretty low sugar product. Great, that was wonderful information, Ms. Yonker. Thank you, can we have a hand oh, for her? Thank you.